Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Killer Influence. Our guest of the show today is Christy Walker Watkins, president of Aristo Media and publicist at Aristo PR. This episode was recorded pre-lockdown while our co-host, Will Barton, was on his holiday in Australia. In this episode, Lindsay Harshaw, community manager at Media Whisper, will assist me with interviewing Christy about what it's like to be a publicist and the tragic story of how she became president of the company after her loving father, Jeff Walker, had passed. We're so thankful that Christy was able to open up to us. And for those of you who are interested in how the PR world works, this episode is for you. All right. So with that being said, I'm excited to welcome Christy and Lindsay. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thanks for being here. All right, Christy. So let's get to the nitty gritty of how you got to where you are. Tell us, sure. tell us everything. I would love to. So um, my name's Christy Walker Watkins, and I was born here in Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA. Uh, but my story, my family's story, actually started way before I was here in terms of working in the music industry. Uh, my grandfather, he was a very successful piano player uh, from Australia, uh, turned record executive in South Africa. He headed RCA South Africa. Um, while in South Africa, he got offered a gig to come to Nashville and uh, be the music director for Jim Reeves. Well, when my grandfather flew to Nashville, he received word uh, that day that Jim Reeves had died in a plane crash. Wow. Uh, so he literally had uprooted his entire life, even you know, left uh, his children in South Africa to come here to start uh, pursuing his uh, career in the States, uh, which his children eventually would follow. Um, but, uh, Chet Adkins knew my grandfather was coming to work with Jim Reeves and uh, was able to get my fa my grandfather a job. And um, he ended up going on to do the Johnny Cash show, working with Eddie Arnold, did the Statler Brothers show, did all the CMA awards when it was the live music with the full orchestras. And, you know, fast forward, my father followed his dad here and um, ended up running a record label that was quite successful at the time and uh, was Billboard's independent label of the year for uh, several consecutive years. And um, after a fallout, the distribution company that they had used uh, ended up closing. They ended up turning their business into a marketing and PR company, which my father uh, started, the Aristo Media Group. And, um, you know, over the years, he's just evolved the company to cater to people that, you know, need services that fall in promotion, uh, publicity, marketing, and even international consulting. That's crazy. So the huge, huge names that your grandfather and then obviously mm -hmm. your father was passed into working with, did that translate into some of you all's clients right off the bat? It did actually, you know, my father ended up working with all kinds of artists that, you know, were country and sometimes they were crossover. And, you know, it really just came down to the fact that, you know, they had so many relationships that they had established through these opportunities and, um, you know, the, the power of family and, you know, working together and making introductions. Yeah. It sounds like your family is pretty well trusted and has been for a million years well, and extremely you. well connected. I mean, I've only worked in this industry for a few years, but everywhere I go, everybody knows about Aww. your family and that's why we're so excited to have you here today. And yeah. thanks, Alexa. That means a lot. Well, we uh, think a lot of this industry and, you know, while people may not be blood, there's a lot of family walking around. They may just not share the, the name. And <laughs> can you, cool. can you give any advice for, you know, us who are kind of in the millennial generation? And I feel like a lot of the people 
can see you as a threat almost like if you're trying to work in the industry Mm -hmm. but when I go to an event that you're at I just see you know you're mingling with all of your uh, colleagues and they're just like how are you doing how's your family how's your kids I feel like it's not really like that for our generation anymore yeah how do you feel or do you think have you seen a difference in that with like you know, just the way that your generation mingles versus ours, I see it. I, I don't know. I, I do. And uh, to be honest, I experienced that myself. Um, when I first came into this business, I was very fortunate enough to have had my father to walk side by side with so he could introduce me to all the people that he knew. Um, You know, my advice to your listeners and people that feel like they're in that position would be to find yourself your mentor. You know, somebody that um, is really rooting for you that you can tag along with. And, you know, if you're invited to go to an event or a networking opportunity, To go with somebody, my advice is to take it and take advantage of it um, and also just not be afraid to make your own introductions. Uh, I know it's easier said than done, but it's like exercising a habit. You know, the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it. And over time, it's going to benefit you. Yeah, there's nothing like being vouched for by someone that you look up to, but it also, I think, is super important for people our age to be, um, you know, bringing to the table something unique and memorable. Um, If you are in those type of situations, you can't just hide behind somebody else that that knows everybody at the party. I don't know. It's important to have your own presence. Absolutely. And, you know, I would also recommend that people get involved in a lot of the music industry organizations that are in Nashville or whatever city you might be in. Um, I'm sure there are quite a few that I am not familiar with, but the ones that I am most familiar with here in Nashville are the Women's Music Business Association, SOLID, this, which is the Society of Leaders in Development, uh, their SOURCE, um, which is a female executive-led uh, organization. Um, what else? Leadership Music. So there's all kinds of wonderful organizations in this town, and they're built to bring people together and learn from one another, help one another, and just be a good group. That's awesome. Um, so with the, some of the people that you've been able to work with, um, do you have uh, like a list of clients that we might recognize that yeah. over the years? The events I handle uh, range across the board. Country Radio Seminar, it's a radio event that happens here in Nashville. Uh, Live in the Vineyard, uh, which takes place in Napa Valley. It's a food, music, and wine festival. Cirque du Soleil, we handle a lot of their Nashville productions. Uh, In terms of artists, we work with Travis Tritt, uh, Keb Moe, Brett Kissel, um, Ty Herndon, and and really so many more. Uh, The list kind of goes on. I'm very honored to to work with a lot of amazing artists. Uh, I could never do it on my own. We have an amazing team at Aristo, uh, probably about 11 people full-time. Nicole and Kim work most closely with me in the PR department. And we have uh, Craig, who's been at the company for over 30 years, no, 30 years this year. He heads our video department, Rick Kelly, Uh, He has been in our radio department for roughly 20 years, Uh, and then quite a few others, Kelsey, Nick in our digital department, and James in video, so the list goes on. Oh, and I must add my mom. I forgot. (laughs) I know I mentioned her earlier, but I love her so much I want to give her another plug. Hey, mom. Uh, And Matt, my husband, who's the glue that keeps it together. So transitioning back from that incredible story that you told us about your family, can you give our listeners um, some background knowledge of how you got to the position that you are in right now, the CEO of Aristo Media? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So I, I had no plan to get into the music industry. I was a drummer growing up 
and I loved performing. It was my favorite thing in the world. Um, I just, I never thought that I would be a businesswoman, to be quite honest with you. And I started going to school at Belmont and through my father's advice, he said, look, you know, you can be a performer all day and night, but in order to, to have success, you still have to have an understanding of how the industry works. So I took his advice and started pursuing a marketing degree at Belmont. Well, of course, at the time, I needed to find some source of income. And my dad, coincidentally, uh, the receptionist position at Aristo was open and I was starting Belmont. We're based on Music Row, four doors down from Belmont. Why not work reception at Aristo? Right. So I got super lucky in that, um, you know, I, while I was going to start at Aristo, I never wanted to live up to that stigma of being the boss's daughter. So, you know, I took my job and the position so seriously. Even though I was answering phones and making notes on post-its for people that came in to deliver a message, uh, I still valued that job. Um, but I also, in that job, got to see what everybody did in the company. I knew who was calling for who and what they needed to talk to them about. You know, I saw the staff coming and going and where they were going. And I just loved the energy that the publicists had. You know, I, I liked how they always had to go to an interview or they were going to do a red carpet. And it just seemed so exciting to me. And they get to wear black all the time. That's right. <laughs> and who doesn't love black? I mean, right. <laughs> publicist uniform right there. But I, um, I was quickly convinced that maybe I am meant to do this. And so I ended up, you know, as time got on, went on, I, I found myself focusing more on the business and less on the performance. I wasn't practicing anymore. And I just felt like I wanted to put any ounce of time I had left into learning more about the business and being better at the business. And so, you know, fast forward, you know, a couple of years. How did you prove yourself to your dad? Like, hey, I deserve a job here. <laughs> you know, that did take a lot of convincing because, you know, going back, he really wasn't sure about me working at Aristo. Really? Yeah. You know, I, I think it was because of that stigma. Uh, my brother was working at Aristo and, you know, I think he felt like having his daughter work there too might be too much nepotism. And, you know, so I, when I got that job, when I, when I, he told me I could come in and answer the phones I, that was another reason why I felt like, okay, well, I got to show him. And that's just my personality too. I'm very A type. Like, don't tell me I can't do something. Right. <laughs> you kind of had to double down. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, anyways, I, over the years, just um, people would come and go, move away, whatever. And I just take on more and more responsibility. I think. He realized I actually can trust that she's going to to do this and get this done. And I never wanted to disappoint him. I mean, he was my main source of motivation, you know, working there. I just I never wanted to disappoint him. And so uh, fast forward even further, um, you know, in 2015, I unexpectedly lost him. Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah, it was. It was very hard. It was hard on myself. It was hard on my husband, but it was also very hard on our staff. Um, as I mentioned, Craig had been at the company for a long time. So had Rick. Um, and, you know, obviously my mom, she, she'd been around the company the, you know, the whole time he owned the company. Um, but obviously grieving is a widow too, but you know, we had to, um, swallow what had happened and just really focus on the future and, you know, let his, uh, 
let his spirit sort of take over and keep us motivated and going because he had put a lot of time and years into this company. By God, I was not going to let it go under, (laughs) you know? Absolutely. So there, I mean, since then, there has been a lot of sleepless nights. There's been a lot of just hair pulling, crying, screaming in my closet, you know, (laughs) um, it's, it's been tough, but I'm, I'm very, uh, happy to say that we're doing well. And I finally feel like I can breathe again and not feel a sense of, um, like angst every morning when I wake up, cause I'm not sure how it's going to go. So. Right. You should just feel proud because you're able to just keep that, you know, memory alive for him. And I know he's so proud of you and Thank just you. having your husband by your side and your mom just with you, I'm sure really helped all that as well. Absolutely. Both of them are my saving grace. I mean, I could not do this if it wasn't for my mom. She helps me with my child. <laughs> um, I have a seven year old daughter and, um, I really struggle with, you know, the fact that I have to give up a lot of time that I could be spending with my daughter because I have to focus on press releases and meetings and networking events. Exactly. Um, So I I am so grateful for her and um, my husband, he is just uh, an incredible partner as well. He has been there from the beginning with me. Um, just to briefly explain how he got started at Aristo. Um, we needed, how do you work with your husband? Oh yeah, I know a lot of people ask that, but quite honestly, it's for us, it, it's easy. It works. Um, it doesn't, you know, hurt that we've been together since freshman in high school. Wow. So, so you really haven't had much time without each other. You are exactly <laughs> right. I think we've kind of grown up together. We know how to push each other's buttons and we know when to like lay off, you know? So, uh, but anyways, long story short, we needed the walls painted. We needed files cleaned out in the basement and who else does dad call for the job? But my husband, my boyfriend at the time, and like me, Matt is uh, a real go-getter and um, he is a very hard worker, sometimes to the point where, you know, it drives me crazy because I'm ready to like turn it off. And he's like, no, we got to do this. <laughs> but I think everybody needs somebody like that in their life. I couldn't imagine laying in bed and then having him roll <laughs> over and being like, hey, so we're going to do this, this and this, like forming a checklist before I go to bed. I would just feel like get out of here. <laughs> well, what's funny is if he was here today, he'd probably say the same about me. You know? right. It probably depends on what day it is. You know, mm-hmm. it's cool that both of you can pick up that slack, though. Yeah. Absolutely. And just have each other to like balance ideas off each other all the time. Just like constantly bouncing back and forth. Yeah. We're lucky on that. So being in Nashville, um, it just seems like historically Music Row has been such um, a male dominated field, um, especially on the business end. Uh, What's it like being a female president of a Music Row company? Absolutely. You know, I, I don't really think about it. Um, as I mentioned, when I was growing up, I was in, I was a drummer. So I was in a very male dominated world then. So I you're was, used to this type of, I I'm mean, so used to it. Yeah. yeah. The odds aren't necessarily I, in your favor, but exactly. I was the only female drummer on the drum line the first year I started and I quickly just learned how to put my blinders on and be one of the boys. That's right. And, you know, fortunately, I, I, I feel like I've been raised by a wonderful man and I've always surrounded myself with amazing men who I, you know, value and trust their opinion and respect. And so, you know, I, I guess I don't view my position uh, you know, as a female, any different. 
Um, you know, as a publicist, I kind of think that I'm in more of a female dominated role because sure. um, most publicists are female. Um, but I heard somebody, I heard a publicist recently say this, and this stuck with me, that it would take a very brave man to be a publicist. And I, I think that's really right on point. You know, the male publicists that I know here in Nashville are all wonderful and great, but it's a tough job, you know, and, um, but somebody's got to do it, right? <laughs> right. Male or female. Power to them all. So how do you stay in the know with uh, being in PR? What are some ways that you stay up to date and... I call you, Alexa. <laughs> and you listen to the podcast. That's right. Just kidding. I, um, I do a lot of reading. I read the trades. I think that's really important. Uh, just reading magazines, watching the news, kind of knowing what's topical, uh, what's... Uh, current issues and things like that. Um, in terms of PR trades, you know, there's PR week, PR daily, there's a lot of things that you can sign up for. Um, but, you know, also just knowing the music too, listening, um, using, you know, Spotify, Apple, and, you know, training the ear to know who is who, and also seeing who's doing well on the charts and things like that. Yeah, that's really, beneficial to hear there are a lot of girls and guys trying to get in this industry right now and I'm not a fan of this whole thing that the industry is oversaturated because I truly believe that there's like room for people that are good and that work hard and network and go for it but could you offer any advice to those who are just you know graduating or starting off and have dreams of being a publicist read read as much as you can also learn to write those are two of the most important fundamentals of PR. Can you give some tips on creative writing things? Like, should people just grab a notebook and just jot down the first thing that comes to mind and just set a timer for 15 minutes? You know, I, I would read people's press releases and see how things are articulated, see that they're not a, a long write-up full of puffery and adjectives they're very to the point who what when where to the facts dry you know that's that's generally what press releases are I mean you you might have a little bit of color here and there and a quote or whatnot but um you know just study what other people are doing and particularly people that are very successful you know it's amazing how much you can learn just by watching and observing what people that are at the top of the game are doing Right. That's one of the goals for this podcast, I feel like, just so people can hear from the greats and learn from them. Yeah, there's just so much to soak in and things that maybe we wouldn't think about or our listeners wouldn't think about to do in their free time. I also would recommend just training yourself to follow up with people. Uh, when you go out to an event, you get a business card. Well, did you follow up with them? No, but you should. Um if you want to make an impression, you have to be sure that you're noticed and you will not be noticed unless if you don't sort of chase that relationship a little bit. Being an industry professional, do you feel like there is such a thing as being bothered too much via email or phone calls? What are your thoughts on that? I do. Uh, um, you know, I think, I think you have to use your instincts and your judgment on that. Um, I would... I would recommend consider timing. You know, if you're working in the music industry and you're wanting to connect with somebody, CMA Awards Week, CMA Music Best Week, ACM Awards Week, those are not good times to be reaching out to a new contact or establishing a new relationship. You know, unless if you have a, a particular reason, a specific reason that makes sense for needing to connect with them that week, then I would highly recommend, you know, trying to find weeks that may not be seen as busy music industry weeks. I know the whole town shuts down and everyone that's affiliated with music in any way has, is like a chicken with their head cut off from top to bottom. Exactly. Exactly. So and even the holidays, too, can be a little tough um, in terms of meeting up with people. Uh, a lot of people leave town or that's 
their only time during the year where they get a bit of a reprieve. So, you know, often it's good to work around those as well. Yeah. And just being mindful of people's time and knowing that it's not only one sided. You can ask for, you know, a coffee or, you know, someone to stream your artist's song on a playlist. But at the end of the day, I think it is a little bit of give and take as well. So I understand you do a lot of international work. Um, What is that like? So we've been doing international work for a long time. Obviously, with my family coming all the way from Australia, uh, we have always had a heart for international artists and wanting to help people pursue their dreams, uh, no matter where they are on the globe. Um, Where I first started international was helping my dad uh, alongside my husband on the CMA Global Live Show, which Aristo helped work on to book talent. Um, We also did some PR for the event every year, uh, and it was held during CMA week uh, in the summer. I actually went to one of those events and I was able to see how cool it was to see international artists, you know, come come here and get on that stage downtown Nashville. It was really cool. It's wonderful. They just love and appreciate it. And like, that's their moment. Like they come all the way to Nashville and are on a platform performing in front of fans. And it just, it means the world to them. And um, it's it's truly inspiring to be a part of, of those kinds of events. But uh, in 2015, before my father passed away, he had met a man by the name of Peter Conway, uh, who was from the UK. Uh, he had coincidentally been in town for CMA week and him and my dad had breakfast and over conversation, uh, they had discussed the idea of having a music festival in London. How wonderful would it be to, you know, host this event, bring US artists over, couple with UK artists, and uh, just have a party in the park. And so our partner, Peter Conway, uh, went back to, to the UK and found us a host partner, which is Canary Wharf. Uh, Canary Wharf is uh, an amazing estate uh, area in London. They have incredible restaurants and shops and wonderful place to visit. If you ever go to London, and they have a beautiful park there. And in 2016, we held our first music festival there. Well, my father passed away in 2015. And, you know, unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it to that first festival. And uh, as a matter of fact, he was going to London the uh, week after he passed away to start the conversations about the festival uh, with the host partner and our our UK partner and um, obviously he did not make it uh, and so Matt and I just joined together and my brother was also uh, there from from the get go since we launched the festival in 2016 it's uh, turned into a monthly residency at a club in London where we bring over one U.S. artist to perform uh, with a U.K. artist that is also on the bill. And then we also have a annual uh, Southern Fridays boat cruise with Buck and Bull in the U.K. And uh, we set sail down the River of Thames with live and recorded country music. It's a fun time. That yeah. sounds so Y'all much should come. Fun. I know. Sign me up. <laughs> Getting my ticket now. (laughs) So we have a question that we ask every single guest on our show. So what is your morning ritual? Uh, Well, I usually get up. Okay, I crawl out of bed. You're not a morning person? Um, It depends. On the day? Yeah, I mean, I do like my sleep. I think it's really important to get good sleep. Um, But I usually get out of bed and then I go and wake my daughter up because she really isn't a morning person so it takes me a couple of jabs to get her out of bed oh my gosh my parents used to have to pour ice cold water on me to get me up <laughs> my dad would pull me by my feet <laughs> oh my gosh um and then my amazing husband makes us coffee uh breakfast whatever and uh we eat really really fast uh what's your go-to breakfast 
oatmeal and banana. Mm. Yeah, pretty pretty lame, but you know. There's some cinnamon on it. <laughs> <laughs> and makeup in the car. You know, I look you while, never, while he's driving. While he's driving, he's yeah. Your oh, I was yeah. gonna ask, do you have a self-driving Tesla or what's? <laughs> oh yeah, no. Got to be safe. I did just get a new car, so. Did you? Yeah. Oh, awesome exciting but anyways you never know what i'm gonna look like when i show up to work with a makeup job and his driving but i saw the greatest meme it said nobody has seen me as my worst like my coworkers have (laughs) and i felt that that is so true i'm gonna steal that i'm gonna steal that for sure um but that generally caps off my morning routine i we live in nashville obviously i listen to a lot of 107.5 in the river and 725 is their gender wars we're usually tuning into that. I think that's the only thing that is sort of a consistent for us. What is that about? So a girl and a guy uh, challenge each other every morning. The hosts ask them questions and whoever gets the most right wins. So either the girl or the boy. And we play it every morning, Matt, Lucy, and I. I love that. That's fun. Well, we really appreciate you being here today and telling us all about, you know, things from your personal life to your daily routine to, you know, just what it takes to become a publicist here in Nashville. And I just want to thank you so much for just being open and honest with us about everything. So I recently came across this quote and it read, make your mess, your message. And I immediately thought of you and just knowing your story, you did such a fantastic job, you know, with the cards that you've been dealt and being a mom and a wife and, you know, president of a company how do you how do you do it all? Well, not to sound cliche, but you know, my family and my support system, our staff, you know, they've been a huge part of, you know, helping me pull through those times that were just really hard. Um, you know, I think for anyone, you never know what life is going to deliver you, you know, or when you're going to lose a family member. Uh, or where the road is going to take you. Or even when you have the days at work where you just, you want to give up and you're just like, I've, I've had enough. You're exactly right. You know, and I think you just have to stay focused and, uh, understand that, you know, yes, you may have problems, but there are people out there that have much bigger problems. Uh, and I feel even though I lost my father when I was 30 years old, I feel so lucky to have gotten to work with him for 13 years, every single day in the office, 13 years over the coffee maker, you know, making our coffee and, you know, having a good morning chat before we got to work. And that's something that not a lot of people get to do with their parents and there's children out there that you know lose their parents a lot younger than I did and um so for me I I just I continue to think about my dad and continue to let him let him motivate me every single day just by um you know his spirit and knowing what he would want me to be and how he would want the company to be and you know, knowing all that, I'm, you know, I'm able to take that and hopefully use it for something good. And hopefully my story can, you know, help other people pursue what they want to pursue and, you know, go after something. And um, my journey hasn't exactly been easy the entire time, but I'm very thankful for the people that have been in my life and to have been given the opportunities that I've been given. And, uh, I know I'll see my dad again. Um, I believe in that. And, uh, I know he's watching out for me and my daughter and my husband and the rest of, uh, our family. So it's beautiful. Yeah. It's inspiring. Thanks. If you enjoyed this episode of Killer Influence, please leave any questions or reviews on iTunes and follow us on Twitter at Podcast Killer or at Killer Influence Podcast on Instagram. Until next time.